From 1830 to 1930, the city of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania had more millionaires than New York City. Hi everyone, Ken here. Welcome to This House. Today we are exploring the lost mansions along with a few that remain from Pittsburgh's golden age. Make sure to hit that subscribe button so you never miss an exciting episode of This House. Unlike the millionaire's rows of other cities, Pittsburgh's was broken up into a cluster of neighborhoods. Back in the mid-1800s, Pittsburgh was the center of manufacturing. Steel, oil, and coal were produced and refined on a scale the world had never seen before, with factories opening up and expanding rapidly. This caused the population to boom, which attracted magnates from other industries to set up shop and call Pittsburgh home. The mansions we are about to see span from Allegheny to the East End, an area that was already considered well-to-do before millionaires moved in. We'll start on Penn Avenue with a mansion named Solitude. In 1871, George Westinghouse purchased this 10.2-acre estate and began remodeling it. He had brought AC current to the forefront of electrical engineering in direct competition with Thomas Edison, who was researching DC currents. Soon after purchasing the house, George had it doubled in size, keeping with the original Italianate architecture to create a seamless series of additions. He conducted several experiments in the basement of his carriage house, which paved the way for modern electricity. But his experiments required massive amounts of energy, so he began searching for a source in his own yard. In 1884, he dug a giant hole in his yard and unleashed the raw power of Mother Nature. He hit a pocket full of natural gas, which caught flame, sending a blazing fire 100 feet up in the air. It burned consistently for over a week before George figured out how to safely cap it off. Just like his other estate, Erskine Park, which we covered in a previous video, upon his death, he had his son demolish the house as a condition of his will. Thankfully, many of the architectural elements were stripped from the home before its demolition and can still be found retrofitted into buildings along the East Coast. Down the road was Greenlawn, the estate of Henry J. Hines, commonly referred to as the King of Ketchup. Henry Hines had come from humble beginnings, starting off in a modestly sized house in Sharpsburg, which is why he had it moved to his Heinz factory to serve as a reminder of his humility and as an inspiration to his workers to achieve their dreams. His factories were cutting edge for the time period, offering dental services and weekly manicures for staff, along with state-of-the-art rooftop gardens where employees could eat fresh food on their breaks. He also treated them to clean, running water in their locker rooms, this might not sound like much, but this was at a time where the common person could only afford to bathe once or twice per month, many of them without access to clean running water in their own homes. With his employees taken care of, he purchased an existing Italianate-style home and had it upgraded to an unrecognizable degree. The new renovations made the house more akin to the Chateauesque style, with white stone blocks composing the facade behind an expansive veranda. He filled the house with not only art, but trinkets that he found interesting. Every Sunday, he would cycle parts of his art collection into his factory for the employees and public to enjoy. Back at home, his maids and butlers were allowed to house their families in the servants' quarters, something that was also unheard of at this time. Henry passed away in 1919, and the house was left to his family. They tried to donate it to the city, but it was too great for the city to afford its upkeep. It was sold in 1924 to a real estate developer who had the house dismantled. The developer then built up to five new homes using the architectural salvage. Today, the only thing that remains from the estate is the stone wall running along the street and a couple of the mini outbuildings. Next door was Henry Clay Frick's house, Clayton. We just toured this house a couple videos ago, so we won't go into too much detail. Frick was an industrialist who sold coke to the Carnegie Steel Company and made a massive fortune. His career was riddled with deaths, scandals, and assassination attempts, but his homes were always his refuge. Clayton had also started off as an Italianate-style mansion that was reworked into a high Queen Anne with soaring towers. A playhouse was built for his daughter Helen to enjoy along with a massive greenhouse. The interior of the home left no space for additional decoration, as Frick's art collection spilled into each room. After a series of unfortunate events, spurred on by Frick, he abandoned his house and moved his family to New York City. His daughter Helen came back to visit from time to time. Taking care of the home, she covered all the floors, furniture, and paintings with dust covers. When she was 93 years old, she moved back into the house and removed the dust covers to reveal a perfectly preserved time capsule from the Victorian era. She died here in 1984, 
leaving it with a trust to fund the house as a museum for future generations to learn about the Victorian era. Today, it continues to be open to the public for tours. Heading over to the East End, we would have found the R.B. Mellon residence in Shadyside, sitting along Pittsburgh's Fifth Avenue high up on a hill. Richard Beatty Mellon was the brother of Andrew Mellon. When Andrew was appointed to Treasury Secretary, he took his brother's place as president of the Mellon Bank. Throughout his life, he made significant contributions to the University of Pittsburgh and Carnegie Mellon University. With his fortune, he also treated himself, building one of the largest homes in Pittsburgh with a rambling brick facade, towering over terrace gardens leading towards the street. The only surviving pieces of the once grand estate are the carriage house and the iron fence which now wraps around Mellon Park. Along Forbes Avenue in the East End sat John Worthington's Squirrel Hill Mansion. John was an executive for the South Penn Oil Company and had the chance to travel the world with his job. While in England, he fell in love with the historic castle he visited and returned home with inspiration for his dream house. It was designed in the Jacobian Revival style. Over time, the facade was overgrown with ivy creeping between the parapet walls. The interior boasted oak wall panels and what was said to be the most ornate plaster ceilings in the entire state. In 1946, the stately home was acquired by Temple Sinai and continues to operate as a synagogue to this day. In 1887, William Thaw began construction of his dream house named Lyndhurst. He had made his fortune in banking before expanding to coal and railroads. He wanted a grand house to flaunt his wealth. The Gothic Revival-style mansion rose four stories, visible above the lush canopy of trees surrounding it. When William passed away, he left the home to his widow, Mary, who was forced to sell it off in pieces to fund her son Harry's legal defense. Harry Thaw hated renowned architect Stanford White for several reasons. Harry alleged that Stanford had dragged his name through the dirt to keep him from being accepted into high society. This was true, but Stanford did this to hide a heinous crime he had committed. When Harry's wife Evelyn was just 16 years old, Stanford White had made unwelcome advances on her, traumatizing her for life. On June 25, 1906, Harry confronted Stanford White in Madison Square Garden in New York City, drew his gun, and shot him in front of hundreds of people. Harry was later found not guilty after a hung jury declared him insane. Now, this is the family-friendly version of the story, but this trial was dubbed the trial of the century. A quick Google search of Stanford White's murder will give you the tragic details of the events if you want to learn more. Anyways, the family's wealth dried up after the court proceedings and in 1942, their mansion was demolished. You might be wondering what happened to Pittsburgh. Why isn't it still like this today? As I continue the story, I'll show you a few more photos of the mansions that once thrived in the area. Just as the fate of so many other cities were bound to the stock market, when the Great Depression hit, Pittsburgh saw its wealth all but wiped out. Families who once had deep pockets were cutting costs at all ends, including laying off tens of thousands of area workers. Quickly, the money dried up and they no longer could afford their massive homes and the upkeep required to maintain them. Following the New Deal and the rise of labor unions, Pittsburgh started to see a revitalization of the working class. But the wealthy would have new hurdles that prevented them from living such extravagant lifestyles, including the introduction of income tax and property tax following the World Wars. For a brief period in the 1960s, the steel industry began to ramp up again, with some calling it the Second Gilded Age or the Pittsburgh Renaissance. But after foreign competition undercut prices, Pittsburgh collapsed with sweeping layoffs. Since then, the economy has been recovering slowly, though in 2007, it was no longer listed as a major transportation hub in the United States. Thankfully, there are still reminders of the city's industrial heritage to be found through its scarce remaining architecture. Which house was your favorite? Make sure to let me know down below in the comments section. And while you're there, make sure to hit that subscribe button so you never miss an exciting episode of This House. I would also like to take a moment to say a special thank you to our This House supporters whose names you can see on screen right now. If you would like to see your name on the screen, please consider joining our membership program today. I'll see you next time on This House.